You know, Mike, I'm pretty sure it's a pretty special video. You know, we got the holiday week. We got Thursday through Saturday. We got the NFL draft for us football fans. That's definitely a holiday. It's my favorite of the year. Um, on top of that, we got mock draft 1.0 and actually the only one we will be doing, which is exciting. Um, and then also, I think we have our first other person on here, other than Mike and Mike. We got Benny here with us today. So instead of Mike, how's it going? Mike and Benny, how's it going? It's going good. Um, happy to be here. Been uh, watching a lot of these videos over the last couple of weeks, so I'm happy to finally be on the on the video. No, and Ben was actually one of my teammates at uh, Hillsdale. He was a wide receiver and obviously one of my friends. So I figured he's a big draft guy, big football fan. So we figured bring him on, maybe get a little different perspective. I know you're all sick of listening to Mike and his terrible intros. So I figured we'd bring somebody else into the cut uh, for a little fun mock draft here. So we're going to take our faces away uh, so that we were not blocking the screen at all. Hopefully you guys can kind of get a feel for who's talking. But uh, yeah, hope, hope you guys enjoy the video. We'll hop right in. So first up, obviously, the Jacksonville Jaguars selecting number one. As you can see, we all had Trevor Lawrence going. I don't think there's really a surprise there. Mike, do you have any real analysis here to give, or what are we talking about here? Absolutely not. If you want to see an, like any kind of analysis on this pick, go to any other draft analyst. Go to Mel Kuyper. They've talked plenty about it. At this point, I'm sick of it. Amen to that, brother. And then getting right into pick two, right? We have the New York Jets. And obviously, again, you're going to see we all have Zach Wilson, quarterback from BYU, Ben. Give us some analysis here. Is this a controversial pick or what? Personally, I think it is, but every everyone that knows more about the draft community is saying this is what's going to happen. So uh, people have insider information say this is going to be pick number two, so can't really refute it. Yeah, exactly. And that's a good point to bring up is that this is us talking what we think the teams are going to do, right? So obviously, like Ben said there, he might have Justin Fields ahead of Zach Wilson on his own personal big board. We're not here for that. We're trying to see who has the better mock. And with that being said, before we do get into pick three where things really start, uh, let us know down below in the comment section after you've watched the video just who you agree with more. I know we might have a little competition going depending on what guys selected where and to what team, but um, I'd be interested to see before the draft who you guys think is going to end up being more correct so in terms of the third pick then when as I said things really begin the San Francisco 49ers the the big trade up from 12 to 3 Mike you have uh you you've kind of bought into this Mac Jones rumor I see what's the what's the deal there because I don't think anybody believes he's the third best quarterback in the draft except maybe the 49ers so what's the deal there yeah just reading into kind of rumors uh, kind of when the 49ers traded up for that you know third overall pick Mac Jones is one of the first names out there. And I think sometimes, you know, the first information you hear kind of sticks. Um, we'll hear more. And right now, kind of the rumor around, and a lot of this could just be garbage, is that, you know, a lot of the 49ers front office actually is leaning Trey Lance, even over Justin Fields. And that, you know, Shanahan is actually, you know, Mac Jones is kind of his guy and he's kind of sticking to it. So um, I don't know. There's just so much out there. It's obviously a quarterback. I've heard more Trey Lance, Mac Jones. I leaned Mac Jones just kind of – just hearing more uh, um, around the league and just analysts kind of talking about it. So is it what I would do? Absolutely freaking not, but um, it's what I'm hearing. No, I most certainly agree with you there. Like you said, a rumor just came out uh, within the last couple of days. It's Lance or Jones. Ben, you went against that rumor, as I did with Fields. What, why did you pick Justin? Is that just because you think, you know, hey, this guy's been the QB too – allegedly for the last year and a half, why are we changing all of a sudden so close? Do you think it's kind of a smoke screen or, or what's going on there? Yeah, I've, uh, yeah, I kind of think it's a little bit of like smoke and mirrors. Um, I mean, with uh, Justin Fields being the starter at Ohio State for the last couple of years, I've seen a lot, lot of him play being like a Big Ten fan. Um, and I mean, he just hasn't shown anything to make me think that he's lost ground. It was always Trevor Lawrence, then him these uh, other three quarterbacks kind of coming up and passing him without, uh, I mean, one of them without even playing, one being a mid-major, and then the other, like, just kind of riding off that championship hype. I don't know. I, I just don't buy it. No, I'm sort of in the same boat as you. You know, it's been Trevor and Justin for years now, it feels like. And then, obviously, you know, initially the Big Ten was, you know, potentially not going to play. It seems like maybe during that period of time, people were so busy looking for a second guy, a new second guy that, uh, they've just started to believe the their own hype in that regard, right? And that's obviously uh, Wilson. That's obviously Lance, like you said. And even now, potentially Mac Jones, right? So I don't, I'm personally not buying the hype either. 
Uh, I don't think that anybody in their right mind would move up from 12 to three for Mac because I'd say there's a pretty good chance you could have got him at 12. I, I will say, I don't think with the 49ers offense, I don't think they're really asking their quarterbacks to do a ton, right? Uh, you look at just the roster that they're fielding. George Kittle, he's a guy who catches the ball short, makes plays on the ground afterwards. Debo Samuel, he led the league or was top five in uh, you know yards after catch just a year, year and a half ago. We were talking about Brandon Ayuk, another guy who they call him Ayak, right? Because like that's just what they do. So, you know, Mac Jones, yeah, he's pretty accurate from zero to 20, 30 yards. But I just think that the versatility and uh, really just the whole skill set that Fields offers would just make a lot more sense there in my mind. So that's why I have them going there. And then as we get into the next pick then, uh, what you're going to see is we. this is really the first time we radically disagree, right? Uh, the Atlanta Falcons, I know some people, if if they believe Max going at three, they say this is where the draft begins. So, uh, Mike, you have an interesting one because a tight end, not usually a top four pick. Talk to us about that real quick. Kyle Pitts, obviously a special player. Uh, what's the deal in Atlanta? It's a mess. It, it's, uh, it's honestly a mess. Like for them to be a top, you know, four pick and them to be in the cap situation they are. Um, that's why recently a lot of rumors about Julio Jones maybe being on the trade block have come up and my thought process is okay I, would I like a quarterback for him probably especially with in my mock draft you have Justin Fields still available um probably where I would lean but you're in a huge you know your cap restraint a lot of that is tied up in your quarterback I think you got to give it one more try and I think at this point what is Atlanta closer to an elite offense or defense it's pretty pretty self-explanatory it's the offense if you can somehow learn keep Julio Jones Calvin Ridley, get a weapon like Kyle Pitts as well on that offense. Good offensive line and still Matt Ryan playing at um, above average, I'd say even almost Pro Bowl level on these last couple of years. I think you got to give it one last run, and I think Kyle Pitts is the best one to do so. No, I know that's interesting because, you know, you say one last run. The last three years they've went 7-9, and 7-9, and, and 4-12, and 12, right? So it's almost tough to say – yeah, let's take one guy here, give it one last hurrah for a, a championship, no less even a playoff berth, right? Because you've been so far away now for quite some time. I, You know, you did mention the Julio Jones rumors. Ben, obviously you have them going Jamar Chase. A lot of people's wide receiver won. What's kind of the thought process there? Are you saying just replace Julio? Or are you ultimately, is this just kind of the start of a rebuild there in terms of, uh, you know, turning over the guard? And then you would say go QB next year. Is that what you're kind of thinking? Yeah, so, I mean, yeah, I was debating between uh, Trey Lance and Chase here. Um, get young by trading Julio this year, and then next year maybe you have the number one overall pick, take the first quarterback available. Unless you really love Trey Lance, I think that's the way I would go. No, it's interesting because Matt Ryan obviously will be 36. This would be a good way to kickstart the rebuild as you kind of fire sale the rest of your team over the next year, right? Um, I would say kind of comparable to – uh, Alex Smith and Pat Mahomes. Only difference was the Chiefs were still competitive, right? But I think giving uh, Lance a year to sit behind uh, not only a good quarterback, but, you know, for really the last decade, one of the best quarterbacks in the league, obviously a former MVP. I think that would give him a chance to really learn. Obviously didn't get to play in 2020 besides one game uh, at North Dakota State, but uh, a young guy, you know, the traits seem to be there, the general sort of athleticism. You know, people said he used to call his own plays at North Dakota State during that first year, which I, I find a little bit interesting. I don't think he'll be doing that in Atlanta, but uh, it'll give him a year to get acclimated and then sort of kickstart this rebuild. I think Ben and I were sort of in the same mold, just uh, thinking of things a in a little bit reverse, if that makes sense. So, yeah, next we got, I think, an interesting team. Um, it's the Cincinnati Bungles, and I think we're all sick of hearing them be a top 10 pick, but here we are again, and um, I think we saw promise this year, you know, with Joe, Joe Burrow coming through until he basically broke his leg in half. And I think that's, you know, some of the reason why I went with my pick. We went Sewell, protect the quarterback, and especially um, Joe Burrow is their future. So I think that's where I kind of went with my pick. But um, I think Michael kind of took an interesting route. I might have went Kyle Pitts if he was still available on my, you know, big board. But uh, what are some of your thoughts on going Kyle Pitts for the Bengals, Michael? Well, you know, it's interesting to me because this seems to be a shoe-in pick on everybody else's board, right? They're saying it's either Chase or it's either Sewell. And uh, to me, I think people are overreacting to two sort of isolated events there. You're looking at one, Joe Burrow's past, you know, previous history with Jamar Chase, uh, having played together at LSU. And two, uh, Burrow tearing his ACL. If you really look at their, if you really look at their line and their receiving core, 
I don't necessarily know if Sewell would be the best pick. Obviously, uh, you drafted Jonah Williams in the first round a couple years ago. You just signed Riley Reef to a one-year $7.5 million contract. Obviously, he's not the long-term answer, but I think he can be a stopgap for, you know, at least the, the short term. And then as you potentially either draft somebody later or uh, go on to get somebody next year, like, I just don't think that that's necessarily a lock going Sewell. And uh, like I said, the receiving core, Tyler Boyd, obviously, T. Higgins, uh, not much elsewhere there. But then you look at tight end and there's not much at all, right? Drew Sample and C.J. Uzoma um, is probably a bottom five tight end room in the league. And when you have a guy that, at least for me, uh, was the was the number one non-quarterback on my board. And I feel like that's kind of uh, been the case on a lot of people's boards, right? The number one non-quarterback, the question is just, does the does the need match? And, and I think with Pitts and Cincinnati, it does. Ben, obviously you disagree. You went, you went to Sewell. Do you think it is just, obviously you got the franchise QB, you got to protect them. Was that kind of the, the same logic you went with Mike with there? So, yeah. Um, and you brought up your uh, Riley Reef signing with them. Uh, I've read a couple of Bengals like beat writers saying like the potential of him moving inside the guard. I mean, he's been a career tackle since he's come into the league in Detroit, but um, I mean, that's interesting to think about. If he could maybe play right tackle, and then you have uh, Williams and Sewell for the next decade. I mean, that, that's, that's pretty good. I think you got to take the opportunity when you can. With the Dolphins, then you're going to see right away, I have them going, Sewell, right? I just think that, uh, you know, you had three first-round draft picks last year. Honestly, to this point, none of them have looked incredibly great. But Austin Jackson in particular, you drafted him potentially going to be a franchise left tackle. And I don't think you can be very satisfied with the results one year in. Ben, you went you went tackle as well. Just considering you've picked uh, Sewell already, you had to go Slater. What's the thought process there? So even if I did have Sewell here, I think I would have kept, I would have still gone Slater. Um, I just think he fits better with Miami, given that they've uh, traded Eric Flowers. Uh, I think Slater has a little bit more versatility where he could play guard and tackle. So like they kind of have that hole with Flowers gone. I, I just thought it was a perfect fit for him. No, I feel that. I, I, I definitely understand. And especially, you know, when you consider that Tua is a left-handed quarterback, you know, who's more equipped to play right tackle right away? Uh, Slater's done it more recently than Sewell has, so you could potentially look there. Or like you said, if they need somebody at guard, I do think Slater profiles a little bit better there. Uh, I did find myself pretty interested by, Mike, your pick of Jamar. You know, you look at that wide receiver room and, you know, maybe not the high-end talent in terms of, yeah, Devontae Parker and Will Fuller, they're good, but they did have some depth, right, in terms of Preston Williams, Jakeem Grant, Matt Collins, Albert Wilson, Alan Hearns. Obviously, Jamar is better probably than all of them, but um, do you just think you got to help Tua anywhere, any way possible? I think part of it's best player available. I don't think that that wide receiver room is elite. Also, kind of just reading into the trades, you know, trading back and then trading back up to six, trading in front of teams like the Lions, um, the Panthers, and, and teams such as those. Um, I think kind of just for me, Miami's a flashy city. I think they go for a flashy wide receiver in Jamar Chase and um, very well could be their best player on their big board. Uh, and I, I do think it still fits in need. Um, I think an elite pass catcher, I think, can ab absolutely help to a develop into hopefully the the quarterback, you know, um, for the near future for the Dolphins. So that's kind of just some of my thought process there. Um, but, like, if it wasn't Chase, it would be protection, you know, kind of where you guys both went with tackle for, for the Dolphins. But kind of moving on from there, um, the one, the only Detroit Lions, uh, and the it looks like we all had a similar idea, uh, a little bit divided in who that name might be uh, picked there. So it looks like we all went wide receiver, kind of just some of your thoughts. Um, I think the most interesting one for me would be Jalen Waddle. Um, kind of some of your thought process there, Ben. I, I just like Waddle's film better. I mean, from what I saw in his time at Alabama, he kind of performed just as well as uh, uh, Devonta. I'm one that's kind of concerned about the frame of Smith. It's a safer fit with Waddle, and uh, as a team that just needs pass catchers, you got to play it safe. I don't know if playing it safe is going for the guy who's actually 5'10 and has had an injury history, though, Ben. I'll be honest. I know a lot of people seem to seem to think like you do, however, that, oh, Waddle is just as talented, if not more so, than Smith. Obviously, I talked about that in my scouting report videos for the both of them, but um, you know, Waddle never had a season over a thousand yards, let alone a guy like Smith who had one of 1,200 and 1,800. So I do have a little bit of a problem with you saying they had similar production. 
Um, and I do have a problem with the size thing, right? Because I just, I just don't quite get it, right? One has, one's played 39 games over the past three years, is six foot, six foot one. And yeah, he weighs a little bit less, but I think that you can game plan around that. But no, in terms of my, uh, in terms of my selection with Jamar Chase, I don't really know, right? It's, it's a new regime. It's a new front office, a new head coach. We got Dan Campbell in here talking about knee biters. Who's the biggest knee biter of this bunch? I have no freaking clue, man. Uh, so I just went with the pretty safe pick, I feel like, in a lot of people's wide receiver one in chase. I know, you know, kind of in my personal opinion, I would actually say the feistiest guy would be Devonta Smith, actually, uh, which is kind of interesting considering those size concerns. But just, you know, when you watch him try and run block, right, the other two guys, don't they don't really do it. Smith, he's at least willing to stick a nose in there. So it'll be interesting to see if, if Dan Campbell, you know, if that's what a knee biter is or if a knee biter is somebody that, you know, the defense is going to be trying to bite their knees as they're running into the end zone, as we saw so so often with Chase in 2019. I have no idea with the Lions. A team with, with really holes everywhere, right? So it's not like anybody should be out of contention, whether it's Micah, whether it's, you know, assuming an offensive lineman's available. I would say, you know, a cornerback, if they were into Sertan or Horn or even Caleb Farley, it's just tough, man. So I think we all... We all sort of went in a similar direction in terms of receiver, considering Tyrell Williams and uh, Brashad Perriman aren't going to cut it. But, but yeah, I think three interesting options, and it'll be an interesting way to see uh, sort of how this regime sort of sets their flag in for their first ever official selection. So uh, from there, let's hop right into the Carolina Panthers. Obviously, right away, we're going to see Kyle Pitts, Ben. You have him going here. They just traded for Sam Darnold. A lot of people, you know, like to say a tight end is a quarterback's best friend. Is that kind of the is that kind of the thought process there with you? So yeah, uh, with with a young quarterback and Darnold going there, we kind of always seen like that nice security blanket, whether it's a pass catching running back or a receiving tight end for them to check down to whenever they're not feeling safe. And I think this is just kind of a match made in heaven for Carolina. I mean, you get probably one of the most athletic players in this draft, most dominant players in this draft, kind of fall into your lap almost at eight. Yeah, the tight ends, the quarterback's best friend. Um, I think uh, left tackle probably is second, if not probably is his best friend. So I think Sam Darnold coming from the Jets, I think he didn't have protection. I, and I think a lot just watching, I have watched a little bit of Jets games, but um, and he just looked scared, timid. And I think some of that was just not having great pass protection in front of him. So um, at this point, Slater is probably one of, you know, the, if he's still available, um, should be one of the top players available on their board. And it fits a position of need. And I think it really helps Sam Darnold out as he develops into this new offense. And um, kind of as we were looking at the job chart for Carolina Panthers, I think that whole, the offensive weapons are interesting. And what I, when I say on paper, other than Chris McCaffrey, they really look elite. No, but I think there's a lot of game plans you could play with. Um, to develop that offense. And I think that might work out, especially if you have a left tackle blocking for, for Sam Darnold. And it sounds like, Mike, you might have a similar thought process. Well, yeah, I mean, like you said, he was seeing ghosts out there in New York. I don't know what he'll be seeing in Carolina, but it'll be a lot of edge rushers uh, if they don't sure up that offensive line. You look at Greg Little, Dennis Daly, uh, Matt Paradis, Pat Elfline, and Taylor Moten. Uh, I mean, some solid pieces. I know Moten played well last year, but I think you got to help him out, right? And you know, when you have the weapons that they do in terms of, you know, obviously Robbie Anderson, you have DJ Moore. I think that, you know, Ben kind of had a, a good idea with, hey, get Pitts. I just don't think he'll be available personally. Um, and then obviously you do have to account for Christian McCaffrey. But otherwise, I think that Slater at this point would have to be the pick. A lot of people say corner. Um, well, they, I mean, they have Dante Jackson just brought in AJ Boye and have Troy Pride, who they drafted last year. So for me, at least, I'm cool with Slater here. A lot of other people might not be, but I think that, if you think Sam Darnold has any chance of being your future franchise QB, you got to protect him at all costs. So speaking of future franchise QBs, this next pick was quite an interesting one because uh, I would argue that the Broncos probably have the worst quarterback room in the entire league uh, headed by Drew Locke, right? And, you know, Locke, he was a former second round pick, just hasn't really developed as anybody would have hoped. And yet the only person here going quarterback is Ben. Ben, you have Trey Lance going uh, what's the thought process there? Obviously, he's off of my board. He's still available on Mike's. Do you think he's just a perfect fit in Denver, or do you think that uh, they're going to take quarterback no matter what? Well, I mean, yeah, I, I, ha I mean, I have him taking a quarterback. Obviously, um, he could either take the starting job right from the beginning, or he sits there and just gets used to the NFL for a year. No pressure going into the next year. Like, I, I think it's just kind of a 
great spot for him. I'm not really sure why you guys went corner with them uh, getting uh, Fuller in the offseason, having Bryce Callahan, but uh, maybe one of you guys can start talking about that. Well, for me at least, Kyle Fuller, one-year deal. He's a free agent next year. Callahan, he's a free agent next year. Kareem Jackson, their safety, he's a free agent next year, right? So that's three of your five starting DBs. I don't necessarily think that this will be the pick. Um, it's. I think this is probably a spot where the Broncos are either going to move up or move out, right? Um, I don't really know if they're going to actually sit here and I'll pick a cornerback, but at least from my perspective, uh, you brought in Ronald Darby, sure, but you know, looking forward, you're going to have to defend Pat Mahomes and Justin Herbert for years to come. So uh, if you're talking about getting your number one cornerback in the draft at number nine, especially a guy with his skill set who can really play that press man and uh, give Von Miller and Bradley Chubb even more time to get to the quarterbacks, uh, that's that was just sort of my perspective there. But Mike, Mike, you still have Fields and Lance available. What what's the deal there? So yeah, with me, I, I'm just not sure the Denver Broncos are ready to give up on the Drew Locke experience yet. Should they probably? Yes. But uh, what two years under his belt? I, I think they give it another try. You had your probably your number one wide receiver, Cortland Sutton, go down for the season. Um, the offense is still, you know, the offensive line is still questionable at best. Obviously, Garrett Bowles probably had his best season. Um, so far, which is a decent season, was a good season for him, um, kind of how he came out of since being a rookie. Um, I just think that defense needs help. I think if they want to start competing, I think you have to start boosting up that secondary a little bit. But speaking of elite defenses, or, you know, maybe we thought might be an elite defense last year and definitely underperformed that, we have the Dallas Cowboys, which I think is an interesting one. Um, it kind of looks, again, like we're all on the same page, similar pages, just maybe some different players. Um, but me and Mike both went horn, which I, I think corner just seems like it, it might be a lock for the Dallas Cowboys. There's a lot of talent on that roster. Um, it's just kind of looking best player available, horn being um, number number two or even number one corner on a lot of people's, you know, big boards. Um, and then obviously Sertan being there, uh, which was our number one corner picked uh, pick earlier here. So, um, we can start with Ben, just kind of some of your thoughts on Dallas going corner and it being certain. Yeah, so, I mean, kind of the same idea you guys had with Denver. I mean, he's your number one corner. I haven't had a corner taken yet, so I'm, I'm just going to use him here. Kind of the same idea that you guys have where defense really did struggle last year to contain the pass. So, I mean, you got you got to answer their needs. I certainly agree. If Sertan's there, he's almost certainly the pick. Um, I think if, if Horn's there, if he's that second guy, then I think he might be the pick. Obviously, there's still Caleb Farley, who a lot of people had him as their CB1 before uh, this sort of back news came out. Um, but when your cornerback room is Jordan Lewis, Trevon Diggs, and C.J. Goodwin, I think you most certainly uh, need help there. And obviously, keeping things inside the NFC East, you know, we got a little run on them here. Going to the, into the Giants, we all had Micah Parsons, obviously the linebacker out of Penn State. I know uh, some character concerns with him. So it's tough to know if he's going to go here. But Mike, what was your kind of logic, at least, uh, behind this selection? Yeah, for sure. I, I think the Giants need help on defense. Um, for a lot of people, Micah might be the best defensive player on their board, and he's still available. Whether that be, I think part of it could be character. And who, again, when we did our draft analysis videos, we said we don't really judge that. Where that's all sitting, I haven't even really looked into it. Um, who knows? But they need some speed on that uh, that defense. They really need someone to kind of put that unit together, and I think Micah could be that guy for them. Um, he has the speed. He has the athleticism. Obviously, he might be lacking strength a little bit, and I think he might be maybe a piece, you know, they could really use him. Um, playing behind Dexter Lawrence, um, and I believe Danny Shelton they signed some space eaters. Micah might be a perfect fit for them in, in that defense. So kind of where I'm sitting, again, we don't know where any of that crap is, but right now it seems like he's still – very much in that first round in the early first round conversation. No, and Mike, in our Micah Parsons video, I believe you said that exactly, right? He's not the strongest guy, so we need to put him behind some space eaters, and this would be that to the to a T, right? I also think, you know, you look at the other holes on this team. They just signed Kenny Gallaudet. There's not very many holes on the back end of the defense. You have uh, Logan Ryan, Adoree Jackson, James Bradbury, Jabril Peppers, Xavier McKinney, right? The only real holes are at that linebacking core, and I think you can put him – you know, we both said that he'd be better as a will linebacker where maybe he doesn't have to call plays and can show off that athleticism. Pair him with a veteran like Blake Martinez in the middle there who can still sort of call the shots while he uh, while he can just roam free and and uh, do everything and anything behind those those hogs in front of him. So I think he'd be a great pick and one that 
as long as those character concerns check out, I would not be shocked uh, happens here on Thursday. Next up then, keeping it in the NFC East yet again. You know, if Jalen Hurts hears, hears any of his former Alabama teammates called, he might have some differing reactions. I think if uh, one of Mike's picks or my picks in Waddle or Smith happen, he might be ecstatic. I also think if he hears Ben's pick, Mac Jones, I think he'll be absolutely furious. Ben, what was kind of the logic there with Mac? They just went quarterback in the second round last year. You don't think Hurts is the guy? I mean, the Eagles really haven't shown that he's the guy. I mean, yeah, they traded Carson Wentz, but they also benched uh, Jalen Hurts last year for Nate Sudfield. And then throughout this draft process, there's been ramblings about Philadelphia wanting to go quarterback. I, and I think I'm buying it. Like, you, you wouldn't say that if you weren't serious about that, especially with a young guy there that you're supposed to be building if he is your guy. But um, I do I do like your guys' receiver picks if – they don't go quarterback. I think that's their next biggest need. So I'll pass it to Michael and why Devontae? Well, I just think at this point, I mean, for them, it would almost be a steal, right? You're talking about a room that, as I said, has Travis Fulgham, Jalen Rieger, Craig Ward, and Arthaga Whiteside, right? You need somebody who can make plays, somebody who can, uh, at least from my opinion, sort of do it all, right? He can kind of stretch the field. He can make plays underneath. Uh, you know, he can turn a bubble screen into a 70 yard touchdown, which uh, with after what we saw from Hertz last year, they might need more of. And I think that's sort of, a, you know, the, a similar reason as to why Mike went Waddle. Uh, he's, he's might be that to an even higher degree, right, Mike? Is that kind of your thoughts there? Exactly. And just for me, Smith wasn't left on my board, but, um, and it's kind of interesting to see all the Alabama players, but speaking of, the Los Angeles Chargers, wow, what a transition that was. Um, it looks like we have a kind of a similar thought here. It seems like all the ones I get that I'm bringing in, kind of similar thoughts, maybe just a couple different faces. You know, Michael being our offensive tackle, or just offensive lineman here, kind of some of your thoughts maybe about the Chargers and, and where they might go with this pick. Well, I mean, it's been what we've talked about already to this point with other young quarterbacks, right? Whether it was Burrow, whether it was Tua, whether, you know, it's other guys that we're going to touch on in the future in terms of Lawrence and some of the rookies, when those teams get their second pick, I think the, the big thing is just, can you protect them? Right. And this Chargers offensive line, we saw it for the duration of Philip Rivers career. They couldn't do that at all. And, you know, they've kind of already addressed the interior a little bit, right? They brought in Matt Filer, uh, from the Pittsburgh Steelers. They brought in Corey Winsley, obviously the center from the Packers. I think now, uh, with a guy like Darisaw, who, you know, a lot of people think could be the second or first best tackle in this class. Uh, I think you get somebody who can watch his blind side and hopefully hold it down for the next 10 plus years. Obviously, you guys went Elijah Vera Tucker, more of a versatile guy. Is that just kind of to uh, to have somebody that can play all over the front for the next decade? Is that sort of the thought process there, Ben? So, yeah, um, looking at the Chargers uh, depth chart at a uh, left tackle right now, they have Trey Pipkins, the third. But when you look at their guards, um, it's pretty bleak. Ode Abushi, and I mean, he was he wasn't good last year for the Lions, so I, I'm thinking Mike is thinking the same thing as me. Absolutely, they could they could use a plethora of offensive linemen. Maybe having you know someone with a little bit of versatility, they can move it around and see the best you know combination that works. And they're going to need to play around with it. Uh, and I think it was a concern last year. Obviously, it was all three of us went. Um, with similar picks and um, hopefully this is a pick that might be able to you know plug and play in one of those spots but um, kind of just moving forward another team that might be in the the market for an offensive lineman and we just basically swap them for um, same players as the last um, as the Chargers but just you know went a diff little bit different but um, back to you Mike kind of you know your thoughts with the Vikings going um, with Tucker well, it's, it's a tough one, man, because that offensive line, I wrote out the five guys, Rashad Hill, Dakota Dozier, Garrett Bradbury, Urza Cleveland, and Brian O'Neill. And next to that, I just drew a little squiggly line and said help. And I think a guy like, <laughs> I think a guy like Elijah Vera Tucker, he most certainly can help, whether it's a guard or th whether it's a tackle. Uh, Rashad Hill actually probably had the best season of any of those guys last year, according to Pro Football Focus. Obviously, uh, you know, their grades are what they are, but we're going to have to trust them here on this one. Uh, I think that Tucker, he could most definitely be a, a elite level plug and play guard, Mike, uh, kind of like you just said on that last one. And I wouldn't really mind if they went Darisaw either. I, they, I think they might prefer Darisaw, um, but at least in my, in sort of my mind, when I think he might already be off the board, that's why I went Elijah. Uh, getting into the next one, because I don't think we need to keep talking about these same two linemen over and over. 
Uh, we have an interesting one, right? Mike, you finally have Justin Fields coming off the board here at pick 15, despite the fact the Patriots just brought back Cam Newton. What's kind of the thought process there? For me, I think I might be drafted more to the team than I am the pick itself. Um, I, I think this is, you know, just kind of back to the rumor mill. I, I think the Patriots have to be on the market for a quarterback. Cam Newton can't be the long-term answer. It, it just doesn't seem like um, he really brings that same athleticism he used to. I think he'd be a placeholder and uh, maybe someone to learn, you know, from behind him if, if uh, Bill Belichick really isn't kind of working towards maybe that new era NFL offense. Um, I think Justin Fields is the perfect guy to do so. If he could, you know, sit behind Cam Newton for a year, learn from him, um, develop. Hopefully they can get that, you know, it, it, whether it be later picks in the draft or just some of the players they already have on the roster, develop some of those offensive weapons. Um, I think this is a perfect fit. And I'm not sure it will happen at this pick. I think it might happen earlier, but it's more of the, the player to the team. Um, I, I think it's a great fit, and I'm, I'd be very interested. I'm hoping for this. I think this is a very interesting thing to maybe bring in a new era for the Patriots, but um, kind of where you said, so it sounds like maybe the offensive weapons on the roster aren't great, and that's where both of you went to maybe bolster that, which is interesting seeing, you know, Bill Belcher go for a wide, wide receiver, which he has done in the past um, pretty recently. So what are some of your what's some of your thoughts with Smith being a pick here for the Patriots? Well, obviously, Smith's a great player, and, uh, I mean, he has to be drafted eventually. Um, so I think Patriots just kind of go best player available with what I've drafted so far and continue on with the Patriot way. I think it's interesting, Mike, because you might be on to something, right? But like you said, in a mock here where we don't have any trades, you know, it's teams like the Lions where they might not go quarterback, teams like the Panthers, right, they're sort of in that – prime trade-up territory to where Fields might end up actually going to this team, but just not in this spot, right? So uh, it, it's interesting because I don't think you're necessarily wrong. I just think that the placement is absurd in my mind. I know with me, at least I went Waddle, who at this point is the third wide receiver off the board. I think that even though Belichick went on that spending spree, you know, Kendrick Bourne, Nelson Aguilar, Hunter Henry, Jonu Smith, I still don't really see that sort of one dominant weapon, that sort of force multiplier that, uh, you know, defenses really have to account to. And is it Waddle? I'm not entirely sure. I know on my big board, I had him as the third of the top three receivers, but he's at least somebody who can stretch the field. And even though Cam might not be able to throw at 50 yards, I think that, you know, you can sort of make defenses feel that pressure of, uh, you know, there is a chance, right? And that's why I went Waddle. I know, um, either way, an interesting pick. Another guy here that I certainly considered was Quiddy Pay. Back in our uh, Quiddy Pay video, Mike, you actually brought up Pay versus Flowers, a sort of comparison. Trey Flowers, obviously the former Patriots defensive lineman. What do you think about that fit here, assuming they don't uh, trade up? Maybe these wide receivers aren't on the board anymore. Do you think a guy like Quiddy could, could sort of be a plug-in play there, whether it's at Fortech or potentially a stand-up guy on the outside? Absolutely. That defense struggled last year after, you know, the year prior being top five defense in the league. Um, for me, I, I just think they have some p players at that defensive end spot that are still in development. Um, I just think quarterback's a bigger need, but I think Quiddy Pay would be um, a nice fit there. It could fall in rotation, offer some versatility, um, and hopefully maybe get that defense back to where it once was. Speaking of bringing it back, a team that might have lost a Pretty elite, you know, corner and Pat Pete. Uh, maybe bringing back some of that same flair here uh, would be the Arizona Cardinals. I think me and Ben went a, kind of maybe taking that route with replacing a guy like Pat Pete with, you know, Caleb Farley. And I think um, they need a corner. That defense has a really strong front seven. Um, and I think having a corner on the back end, he doesn't need to cover long. He just needs to um, be efficient. And obviously sometimes rookie corners have – um, some problems, especially early in their career. But I think Farley's a guy that can they can plug in day one and, and be competitive. Will he be, you know, a Pro Bowl type talent? Probably not. But um, with that front seven, I'm not sure that's exactly what they need. So, um, Ben, kind of similar situation um, with you there. So, yeah, I went for, uh, Farley over J.C. Horn, which uh, might be backwards compared to what most people think. Um, going back to last year, I mean, Farley, before his opt-out, was supposed to be – the CB1. So I, I think other than that back injury, assuming it's healthy, I think he still goes before Horn. And um, Michael, you go an interesting direction here with the first safety taken off the board. Yeah, I had Morig, honestly, because 
Um, I thought that the signing of Malcolm Butler could potentially quell the cornerback concerns in the meantime, whereas, you know, for me at least, you look at that defense, assuming you do bring in a guy like Morig or, you know, potentially one of the other safeties later in the draft, uh, behind that front seven, you're talking about four just elite playmakers, right? Jordan Hicks, you're talking about Isaiah Simmons, Buda Baker, and potentially an elite young and dynamic safety like I think they would get here in Morig. Um, to me, that's just an incredibly interesting proposition, right? And could really spearhead uh, one of the sort of best defenses compared to last season in, in the league, right? One of the quickest turnarounds, just adding a guy like Watt, getting a guy like Chandler Jones back. And even though you lost Pat Pete, uh, you know, future Cardinals Hall of Famer, uh, I think bringing in a guy like Butler could sort of ease some of those short-term worries. Uh, whereas, like Mike said, corner is one of the toughest spots to transition in the league. Uh, would Farley be able to produce immediately? I think there's some sort of concerns there. Obviously, Ben, you mentioned the back injury. I think that's another cause for pause. Obviously, like you said, not even two, three months ago, he was the cornerback number one on most people's boards, though. So I do think that it, it is uh, certainly a solid pick from your guys' perspective. I just think uh, I have him fallen a little bit more. And then in that regard, somebody that I wish was falling a little bit more, Christian Barmore, right? Anybody who's watched my Scouting Report video, uh, you know I wasn't a huge fan of Barmore. I had him graded in the middle of the second round. Uh, a guy who I had graded in the middle of the first round, though, was Zavin Collins, though. So, Mike, what's up with Zavin, linebacker out of Tulsa? Your second linebacker off the board, I think, was important to note because – uh, obviously, JOK out of Notre Dame, a lot of people are high on him. You have Zavin going first? Yeah, for me, uh, I kind of – I think linebacker makes a lot of sense for them. I think it's a position of need. Obviously, they have Corey Littleton kind of taking that weak side linebacker spot, but they do show weakness just in middle linebacker, someone to run uh, run that defense and put everything together. So I think um, – and we – me and you, Mike, disagree on this. We kind of – when we talked about Zavin Collins, we, we talked about where is his best fit and um, – I said probably at the middle linebacker spot, you disagreed there. So I, for him, he's a middle linebacker. I think he might be – I'd probably take Jamin over him, but I think Zavin, um, tough guy, strong at the point of attack, I think might be something that Mike Mayak and, and Gruden might be looking for. So I think it's a, a maybe not the best player available, but a good fit for the team and maybe what they're looking for, just some of that toughness, grit. Uh, and I think he offers that. And, and I probably – I think D-tackle is a bigger need – and concern, but I'm just not on the Barmore train, and I'm not sure everyone else is either. So, um, Ben, if you want to talk a little bit about Barmore and kind of where you went with with the pick. Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm not necessarily on the Barmore train either, but in this class, we see a lot of weakness at that defensive tackle spot. So how are the Raiders going to answer that question of who's going to play in the middle of their defense, you know? You, you got to kind of plug it early, so – it's kind of a pick out of need, not necessarily uh, value. And, Michael, are you kind of thinking the same thing? I don't know, man. Solomon Thomas showed a lot of promise a couple years ago. Maybe they can rekindle that flame. They signed him. They got Jonathan Hankins. I don't know what he's doing in 2021 uh, as a starter on defense. But, no, I, I think that was sort of my logic as well. I know that entire team is just ugly. Uh, no offense to Raiders fans, but – um, as much as I love Mike Mayock and, you know, his, he was great on NFL network. Maybe he should go back there um, because you look at what he's done to that offensive line. If you're going to start the season with, with Brandon Parker, Denzel Good and Nick Martin as, you know, your right tackle, right guard and center after just having had Trent Brown, Rodney Hudson and Gabe Jackson. Like, I just don't know what we're talking about here, right? You look at that wide receiver core. You took, you took Henry Ruggs ahead of Jerry Judy and CD Lamb and now, all you have next to him is Zay Jones, Hunter Renfro, John Brown, and Willie Sneed. Like, I, I just don't know what's going on with this team. I wouldn't be shocked if, yeah, go ahead. Take a guy like Barmore. You'll probably be picking uh, more closely to the top five next year. In all honesty, I don't really think that I, any way that they go, uh, the Raiders are going to be picking in a similar range next year. Right after the Raiders, we got the Miami Dolphins picking to get in. I think this is interesting. I think the Najee Harris, I'm not going to lie, I – Quiddy pay is a pick for, for me and Mike, but I think Najee is actually kind of interesting in Miami, and I, I wouldn't be surprised to see this come draft day. So, Ben, if you kind of want to go into some of your thoughts with that pick. Yeah, so he's – I mean, he's comfortable playing with Tua. Obviously, they went to college together. Uh, so maybe Tua pulls some strings for that. And uh, running back's kind of a need for them. I mean, Miles Gaskins is there, yeah, but is he the answer? I don't know. I think Najee offers a truth. Uh, three down back that you can kind of just plug in day one and have him be your starter. Yeah, I think that's interesting. I, I, and the, the thing I find interesting about it is me and Mike doing um, 
just the, the, the evaluation on Najee. He's not one of our top running backs uh, uh, really available, but I could, I see him being a top running back taken off the board. Um, so that's why I just find it interesting. I think it is a fit. I could see, you know, seems like kind of what, what I went with the last pick with Miami. It's a flashy player for a flashy team in a flashy city, but a lot less flashy. I think is where me and Mike went just the, with, with, with Quiddy Pay. Um, I think it's a player. They got rid of Kyle Vinoy. Um, they definitely need some pass rushing help or at least some uh, some depth and probably a starter, in all honesty, with that depth chart. Quiddy Pay could probably start day one, and I think it's probably their biggest position of need. Um, Mike, you kind of have the same thought process there? For the most part, yeah. I know it's an interesting uh, sort of proposition to go back to a Michigan D end after old taco time didn't work out there. But I think that he's probably the best player available on the board that fits their needs, right? You could argue uh, Owusu Koromoa. You could argue Zayvon Collins on my mock, uh, potentially as well as, say, Jamin as well. But I think that Quiddy sort of fills that role of Shaq Austin to a T, right, where maybe not a guy that's going to get uh, 10, 12, 13 sacks, but a guy who can come in, be an instant, uh, instantly dominant run defender as well as offer something as a pass rusher as well. You know, in terms of the Najee pick, I think that – uh, Mike, you summed it up well, right? Somebody that we don't really have a lot of faith in, but it seems as though the general consensus is that uh, he's going to be some beast, right? So I wouldn't be shocked if he goes here to the Dolphins. I know a lot of people have him in the sort of top 25. I personally don't. I had him graded as a third rounder. So um, an interesting pick for my standards. I don't really know how much that'll help Tua, in all honesty, right? Um, you're looking at a guy who struggled immensely last year. Ryan Fitzpatrick looked better than him on a on a week-to-week basis to the point they're pulling him out of games. So I don't know how much will a, how much will a 23-year-old running back that's coming in as a rookie that, you know, half the time is bouncing off the backs of his offensive linemen. How's that going to work out? I guess I'll have to wait and see. In terms of also waiting and seeing, Mike, I had to pick a picture of Trey Lance scratching his head because how the heck is he still available on your mock? It's pick 19, man. What's going on? That's a good question. Um, I think this might – I don't know. I guess I just didn't see the – the really the stretch for some of the teams that, that you chose quarterbacks for, I guess I didn't see the same need or really did it make sense in their timeline. Uh, this kind of like Justin Fields might be a team player fit, maybe not at this pick. If, the, if they really want to probably land Trey Lance, I think they have to trade up. Um, I just couldn't, I don't know, when I was putting together the draft, I just couldn't see a lot of those teams in the top 10 really drafting a quarterback or kind of even going 10 to 15. I couldn't see it. Um, and then it eventually came to, the Washington football team, which is how the hell are they still the football team? I'm not sure. But um, I think if Trey Lance is available or even if they, they have an opportunity to trade up for and I give up too much capital, I think this just makes way too much sense. And I think you guys would agree <laughs> uh, with him still being available on my board that this pick is a no-brainer. They should run to the podium as fast as possible um, if he is available. No, I certainly agree. And speaking of guys who run fast, that is that is kind of what I was going for with Owusu Koromoa. Uh, you're talking about an elite front four there in Washington with Chase Young, Deron Payne, Jonathan Allen, Montez Sweat, et cetera, et cetera. But you look at their linebackers, right? You have a 30-year-old John Bostic, a fifth rounder in Cole Holcomb, who you know I, I will say has overperformed draft expectations. And you have another fifth rounder in Kaliki Hudson. And, and if those are your linebackers, there's going to be a lot of runs leaking into the third level uh, on a week-to-week basis. So I think you got to address linebacker here, get somebody who can help uh, sort of plug those gaps. Maybe not uh, Owusu's strength, but it's still something that he can do better than those guys in my eyes. Ben, is that sort of a similar idea that you were going with? Yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, they need a linebacker. Um, I would have liked to see football team take a quarterback, a wide receiver, but at this point on how I've drafted, there's not really uh, a quarterback or a rece- receiver that's a – worthy of the 19th overall pick. So I think you got to fill your third best need with uh, Ousa Koromoa. Yeah, for sure. And, and if I didn't have Trey Lance on the board, or if he was taken before, I probably would have went um, Owusu as well. But I got a question, Mike, for you. Uh, you still have Mac Jones on your board. Do you just not see him as a really a first-round quarterback, you know, talent? Or what are some of the thoughts there skipping on a quarterback still available? You know, my thing um... – 
they did get Ryan Fitzpatrick, and I just don't think that, in my opinion, the QB5 at pick 19, I just don't know if that's the answer. I know everybody wants to say, oh, they're going to be gone by pick five, right? I just don't really buy that. I can't really think of a historical precedent that we've seen where five QBs go in the top five or five QBs even really in the top 10, right? So uh, I wouldn't be shocked if one of them drops, and I wouldn't be shocked if it's the guy who was surrounded by uh, four first-round receivers over these last few years, has only really played in 11 games in a 2020 pandemic-shortened season that was – uh, you know, just wild in, in general in terms of guys opting out, opting in, doing all those sort of things. We had conferences that weren't even going to play and others that didn't. Um, I, I think that if anybody falls, it would be Mac, although I will say I don't have him falling much longer, right? I think my man Ryan Pace, the guy whose job is on the line in terms of that entire coaching staff, I think that uh, when, you were expect, when you were expecting Russell Wilson, you got to get somebody. So uh, to me, I think Mac and Andy Dalton, that's an interesting discussion. I think that'll make for a fun competition in training camp, and that's why I had him being picked here. You guys went a little bit safer, though, I will say, potentially a little more realistic. Uh, cornerback, right? Obviously, they lost Kyle Fuller. And considering you have uh, Devontae Adams, uh, Adam Thiel, and Justin Jefferson, and Brashad Perriman to watch out for on a weekly basis, I think that they, <laughs> that they most certainly need to fill that hole. So, Mike, what, what was kind of the general thought process there? Yeah, that's it. You're, you're you're in a division that, other than the Lions, there's some elite, you know, wide receivers um, with the Vikings and the Green Bay Packers. You lost Kyle Fuller, your your true number one corner. You had Jalen Johnson, who actually looked pretty good in his rookie season for being a rookie corner, um, who might maybe develop into your number one, but then you need a number two. Um, and that's where Newsom comes into play. Uh, I think it's the best corner on the board with Farley being – uh, I'm gone. And, he, and honestly, Newsom might be picked before Farley, so it'd be a swap him kind of situation. Uh, I just think corner makes way too much sense here um, for the Chicago Bears. So, Mike, you were talking about right there, they might need a corner too. They did just sign Desmond Trufant and Artie, and Artie Burns. Ben, do you think those aren't viable cornerback twos and threes? Because you also went corner with J.C. Horn here. What's the deal there? The corners, the probably second hardest position to make the jump to the NFL level other than quarterback. So like, even if they did sign those two got those two veteran players, I mean, you're still getting a really good corner that can learn for a full season and then hopefully take over as a starter uh, in uh, two years. But, yeah, and um, by then Ryan Pace and uh, Matt Nagy will be fired and uh, the next regime will have something good to start out with. With that being said, on to the next pick, uh, the Colts, right? You guys both went a similar direction here in terms of Aziz Ojulari, uh, who at least for Mike and I, I think we were both big fans of him. Mike, sort of talk about him, obviously, you know, putting him around DeForest Buckner, Darius Leonard. That's a sort of a nasty combination there uh, with just how far along Aziz was as a pass rusher compared to some of these other guys. Was that sort of the idea there, just get another nasty guy in that front seven? Absolutely. Um, I, I think they need a pass rusher. Obviously, you have DeForest Buckner. Just putting putting pieces around DeForest. I, I think um, Aziz is the kind of guy, like, it, can he probably be, you know, that foundational piece in the defense? Uh, no, or he would pick been picked earlier. But I think he could really want, win some one-on-one -on -one battles with some tackles. Um, I, I think he excelled in that. I think, you know, um, holding that edge, he did extremely well, which I think – just kind of that Colts defense that just a, it's a tough group. And I think he actually plays really tough for uh, being kind of that three, four outside linebacker. I think he plays bigger um, than he actually is. And I, and I think that's something that that defense is really looking for. Um, so I, I think it's just, a, it's a nice fit. Um, it, it makes a lot of sense. And maybe it doesn't make sense for that team to go defense when they already had a top three unit um, last year. So I could be wrong, but I, I just like the fit, and I think it fits a position of need. Um, but I kind of a similar situation in thought. Yeah, so I was looking at the, the Colts' uh, depth chart, and, I mean, it just didn't have that much flash outside of, like, DeForest Buckner and uh, Darius Leonard. So this is probably one of my favorite picks of the entire draft, honestly. But, uh, Mike, you go uh, offense tackle. Well, kind of, you know, as I was hinting at when I passed it to Mike, talking about an add a nasty guy to the front seven, I think that's exactly what I did just to the front five on offense, right? He was talking about building around DeForest Buckner. I'm adding perhaps the nastiest guy in the draft to build around Carson Wentz, right? Um, you know, you're looking at an already elite offensive line in general. They do have one hole, Sam Tevy, a left tackle, right? I think you put in uh, Tevin Jenkins, put him next to Quentin Nelson, 
and you just let Jonathan Taylor roll, baby. Carson Wentz hasn't had a, a rushing attack quite like that since well, Garrett Blunt back when they back when they were making the playoffs and and going on deep runs, ultimately a Super Bowl victory. I think that even though I did have some sort of issues with Ted Vinish's general technique, uh, obviously, if you guys want to hear me go more in depth on that, I think I did like 17 minutes in his own scouting report video. This isn't the time for that, but I think that you can sort of uh, hide some of those concerns if you bring him here and put him next to Quentin Nelson. And, you know, honestly, I wouldn't even be shocked if last year they played Quentin a little bit at left tackle. Would it be that crazy of an idea to put Quentin outside and put Tevin inside? I don't even know, right? I think that at that point you're just getting some nasty dudes and you're going to you're gonna make Carson Wentz's job as easy as possible to make him uh, – to give him the best chance of looking like that MVP Wentz that we've seen before. Mike, what are your thoughts on that selection? I know you – you talked about the nasty front seven. You think that would be solid? Absolutely. Um, I, I I just think that team the Colts just kind of um, really what's their persona. I think it's being nasty. So if you can get a gritty player there, I, I think being the front, either front seven or front four, um, or you know an offensive lineman, I think it just makes a lot of sense. I think it's their personality, it's their persona, and um, I think the pick makes a lot of sense. And speaking of nasty, a team that, you know, maybe nasty, gritty, kind of, you know, with that running attack with Derrick Henry, we got the Tennessee Titans. And I think actually all three of us kind of went, a, you know, a nasty, gritty route, but just all very different uh, in that measure. So um, I think probably the player that makes the most sense for, for me um, kind of filling that role, but he just wasn't available on mine or probably Mike's big board would be Quiddy Pay to the Titans. So, but if you want to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so we see a player that's uh, really good at, like, holding the edge uh, and containing. And that's kind of what you need out of that four attack and that 3-4 defense. Best player available on my board. So I think they just kind of take a value pick here and uh, continue on. Well, Mike was talking about routes, and, you know, we all went in different routes for toughness. Well, I don't know about toughness with Bateman, but he certainly knows how to run routes, right? Um, I would say next to Devonta Smith, one of the best route runners in the draft, I think would be a perfect compliment to a guy like A.J. Brown, right, who obviously is one of the grittier, nastier players in the league. And, you know, when you lost a guy like Corey Davis, who, you know, maybe never really reached his fullest potential um, out there in Tennessee, I think replacing him with a guy who uh, could really thrive and has a skill set opposite of a guy like A.J. Brown, I think that he could really fill those shoes, if not uh, surpass them in a sense, right? I think Bateman, uh, this would be a great spot for him. And I was kind of talking in my video about him uh, to the point that, I wouldn't be shocked if he looks the best in that rookie season just because of the situation he's being put in, right? And compare him and his situation to some of those other ones that I've had mocked, right? Uh, whether it was Jalen Waddell in, in New England or Devonta Smith in Philly. Well, who's going to have a better rookie year, you think? The guy who is going to catch 70 balls off play action alone in Rashad Bateman? Or are those guys having Cam Newton and, and Jalen Hurts noodle arm prone to him, right? I just think Bateman would be a great fit. Um, I don't necessarily hate the, the Christian Barmore fit, at least, in terms of filling a need. I agree that defensive tackle and defensive line is a need, Mike. Again, maybe Barmore is not my cup of tea, but um, obviously filling the whole uh, left by Darrell Casey, right? That's kind of kind of the idea there. That's exactly it. Jeffrey Simmons kind of – it's more of Jeff, Jeffrey Simmons replaces Darrell Casey, and then Barmore is kind of that, that second option there in, in that front four or at least, you know, at the D-tackle position. So, um, obviously, I don't love the player. I think that's just a really weak D-tackle class. But eventually, when it's to be taken off the board, and eventually a team with that need is probably going to be taking Barmore in the first round, just kind of how I see it. So, overdrafting, but we see it every year. So, it's, it, it wouldn't be a surprise to me. Um, but, you know, kind of getting into the next team, um, maybe a team that's overdrafted a few players in their time, <laughs> would be the New York Jets, man. So if any team can go best player available and it still be a position of need, it would probably be the New York Jets. Probably one of the worst just rosters currently in the league, at least in my thoughts. So there's really holes at any, you know, position. Um, so I think a lot of us probably here went best player available. Um, me being Jenkins, helping, you know, that offensive line, helping, you know, probably protecting Zach Wilson. They need some protection. Obviously they got pretty good left tackle last year in the draft. I think that, you know, Will develop so maybe you know adding a right tackle um a pair of book tackles definitely isn't going to help especially when you have a rookie quarterback coming in some of my thought process there uh looks like you guys had similar thought process just different players um some of that just could be you know players available on the board 
Um, so we'll start with, you know, you might go with Farley. Um, some of your thoughts there. Man, this cornerback room is atrocious. We're talking about Bryce Hall, Bryce Huff, Blessin Austin, and Justin Hardy. And as much as I agree with you, Mike, in terms of we need to get Zach Wilson some help, I think that that defense has to be cleaned up as well, right? You can't go into an NFL training camp with those guys as your best four corners, uh, let alone into a regular season game. So I think a guy like Caleb Farley, who, uh, like Ben talked about earlier, was you know the number one guy just a couple months back. I think that that would be a perfect uh, – pick in my mind if he falls this far uh like Ben said I don't know if he exactly will it all depends on that back injury but you know hey if you're the Jets and you can make the best of that bad situation there and stop that drop I uh I think that he would be a good fit Ben I know you went Greg Newsom yeah we we see a player that is very fundamentally sound in his game and I think that just makes him an easier plug and play from day one of training camp for the Jets and speaking of plugs and plays Mike uh, as we get into the Steelers here, you had Najee, right? Again, we already talked about him, a guy that we are not necessarily a huge fan of, but plug and play to the highest of levels, right? What's kind of the thought process there? Yeah, I just think, you know, kind of they have to replace James Conner. It's probably one of the biggest holes on their offense or actually just team in general. They have a really good defense, um, probably need some help on that offense. There's really no, there's no quarterbacks available at this point. Um, they could be a team in the market to trade up if one of those quarterbacks fall. Um, at least in some of those conversations, um, to eventually replace Big Ben. But as we talked about with with Ben taking Najee off the board, I you know obviously I'm not a fan of the player and him being the first running back off the board, but a lot of people are. And, and you know, I think you know being a little bit bigger back, um, running between the tackles, I think it might fit some of the Steelers. You know, something they might be looking for to replace James Conner. I really don't think they need a ton of help on that defensive side. So, um, and. Running back is probably their biggest, you know, position of need at this point. And for a lot of people, this is this might be the best player available. Though I would very much disagree. And Mike, I know you're on the same page there. So I guess going with that, um, I think your pick's interesting for them. Them actually, you know, maybe adding a player to that defense with with the corners. Maybe what's some of your thought process there? Well, the thing is that, at least from my perspective, you know, they were pretty bad against the pass last season, especially after Bud Dupree went down, right? You could sort of see some of the chinks in the armor at that point, and they've only gotten more exposed, right? You've lost Steven Nelson, your number two corner. You've lost Mike Hilton, uh, their, their nickel corner, one of the best in the league. And, you know, at this point, you have Joe Hayden, Justin Lane, and Cam Sutton. And although I agree that offensively there are some holes, right? You know, you lost James Conner. You lost Alejandro Villanueva. And Marquise Pouncey retired, which is sort of where I think Ben went with his pick. Uh, I, I just still think that there's some more pressing needs if you're a team that wants to compete right away. Uh, in, in 2021. I know there might be some better running backs, at least in my mind, available. So maybe I maybe I put some of my own flavor in this pick because I do think Najee uh, very well could be the pick. I just think it would make more sense to go a high-level corner and then you know try your luck at a Javante Williams in the second or maybe even a guy like Kylan Hill uh, or somebody like that in the third or fourth. So, uh, Ben, I know I did kind of talk about the, the O-line need already. You were still thinking of improving that running game, right? That was kind of the general idea with Dickerson. I know a little bit early than some people might think, but um, still an interesting pick here. Yeah, so uh, Dickerson's going to help improve the team right now and build for the future. I mean, he's a he was a five-star tackle in high school. He played all five offense line positions in college. So he also offers that versatility if need be. But, um, I mean, Big Ben's not going to be there forever. So getting a – a young center to kind of maybe make that bridge for a young quarterback coming into the Steelers system that much easier. No, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I also think kind of getting into my next pick, that was sort of the reasoning that I went with Pat Fryermuth uh, here to the Jacksonville Jaguars. We're talking about, again, a, a team who right now, if you're putting Trevor Lawrence in there, you know, having Chris Manhurts as your top tight end target. I don't really know if that's going to do him many favors, right? And especially um, when we're talking about somebody that's sort of that dump off threat, uh, as Ben talked about earlier in terms of, you know, hey, check it down to a running back, maybe hit a tight end up the seams quick. I think that a guy like Pat, who uh, showed that at Penn State these past three years, could be a really invaluable asset. I know certainly higher than uh, a lot of people have him, certainly higher than I would have him, right? Obviously, I had him graded uh, as sort of a, top of the third round prospect, but I still wouldn't be shocked if with Kyle Pitts having gone so early, that sort of second and third and fourth tight end, if they start to 
almost artificially have their draft stock risen, uh, if that makes sense. So you guys, though, obviously agreed. You know, I'm not saying safety is not a good pick. I just had Morig go already. Uh, Rudy Ford and Andrew Weingart are their top two safeties. So, Mike, uh, that has to be that has to be an instant hole if you want to compete, right? Absolutely. And to be honest, for that team, you know, picking the number one overall, they don't really look that bad on paper. Not to, They don't look good by no means, but they don't look like a number one overall, um, you know, picking type team. So I think they can, you know, I don't think they're that far away. So I think, you know, and this very well could be the best player available at this point. I, I, um, I think, it's, you know, position of need, one of the top players available, it just makes too much sense. And it, it might be just a match made in heaven if he's still on, you know, available for, for them to draft. So, uh, I think it just makes too much sense. And obviously, you know, stretching for a third round grade tight end, probably not where I would go. But again, if you ever watch the Seattle Seahawks draft, it's not always where we think they would go. It's their own thought process. So I think Morig honestly makes Jacksonville a sneaky, potentially really good uh, secondary with uh, Sha- Shaquille uh, Griffin and uh, CJ Henderson going into his second year. I think they could maybe be a defense that you don't really want to play given their front seven and then adding to their secondary. That's certainly interesting. I think you guys might be a little bit higher just on Jacksonville than I am. I know for me, I think it's going to be a little bit longer term of a rebuild. And that's why I sort of went with uh, something say like the Lions did in 2009, right? Where you take Stafford one overall and then Brandon Pettigrew 22nd, I I want to say it was uh, maybe even earlier than that, but uh, regardless, I think that sort of pairing that young QB up with that young safety net, that was just sort of my uh, thoughts behind it. Not that I necessarily agree with it, but I still think they're a couple years away. So making Lawrence's life as easy as possible, uh, to me at least, would make quite a lot of sense. I know a team that it was pretty tough to make sense of in terms of where to go would be the Cleveland Browns. I felt like if we're just looking at comparing rosters as of you know April 27th, April 28th, when you guys are watching this, uh, the Browns might have one of the one of the best rosters in the league right now, right? They could very easily be, you know, if, if it weren't for the sort of lack of experience uh, out of some of those guys, they could very easily be a Super Bowl contender. And uh, I think in that, it's hard to find holes, right? And that's why I had them going with a, uh, a little bit of a reach in my mind in a third wide receiver in Terrace Marshall Jr., obviously a uh, wide receiver out of LSU. I thought that he added something that they didn't necessarily have last year, especially after Odell went down. But even if Odell was healthy, I think that he being a six, two and a half guy, uh, being more of a jump ball guy who can go up and win those contested catches, add that to Jarvis, add that to Odell, uh, not only the LSU trio, but sort of a good trio of of, uh, various skill sets, I guess you should say. I think that he, at least for me, makes a good bit of sense. But you guys both went linebacker, right? I know they have a guy like Anthony Walker there, who I think is solid, Malcolm Smith, Mac Wilson. It's not as though it's a terrible group, but you guys very well might be right that it potentially is the weakest one on the team. Mike, you have a guy like JOK available all the way down here. Uh, has to kind of be a steal for them, right? Absolutely. Um, and, and kind of when we did the you know draft evaluations on both these players, I actually probably leaned Jamin a little bit. But I think I said a lot of Owusu was going to be kind of my thoughts on him would be the fit. And the Cleveland Browns are a perfect fit. They got space eaters. They got tons of talent around him. And honestly, they can use him in that, you know, add some of that versatility. I think you get the best out of him, kind of what we saw at Notre Dame where he was using a little different positions. I think you could use him like that, and it actually might work. I don't think I like it for most teams, but I'm not saying use him as a Swiss Army knife, but I think you could – put him out a little bit and um, give him some some room to roam. And I, I think he could really, you know, thrive in, in, with that team. Um, so, yeah, it's a steal for them. I think it makes way too much sense if he is, you know, available at this point. And then Jamin, obviously, has been one of the latest risers in this draft season. A crazy pro day, but then I think when you reevaluate the film – uh, you really do, at least in Mike and I's opinion, when we did do that uh, scouting report video, I think that it was somebody, he was somebody that we both thought should be a first round talent, although maybe he won't go. Ben, you have the Browns pulling the trigger there. Um, were you just equally impressed with what you saw from him or or what's the kind of thought process there? Yeah, for sure. I really enjoyed what I saw from him. Um, and pairing that with the Browns needing a linebacker, I, I like that better than 
taking a third wide receiver. I mean, I get why you would, but I I have to roll with this day one starter, you know? No, I certainly, I certainly understand that. I know for me, at least, like I said, you would kind of have Jarvis as the slot guy, Odell as the wide receiver one, and then more of that sort of red zone threat, uh, a significant upgrade, at, me, at least in my mind, over Donovan Peoples-Jones and Rashard Higgins. But uh, speaking of teams that might need an upgrade at wide receiver, we have the Baltimore Ravens. And, and Ben, you're the only one here who actually did go receiver. Talk about Rashad Bateman here real quick. Yeah, so I was actually kind of surprised by him. Uh, Mike, you and I were talking about him the other day. I thought he was a lot bigger. He listed at like 6'2", but as pro day, he was six feet. So Ravens still need a wide receiver. They said they were going to take a receiver with one of their two first-round picks, so I haven't taken the best one available. It's certainly interesting. I'll, I'll say that. I know uh, one of the one of the team needs that they've really failed to address, right? I mean, they're a team that Des Bryant was getting snaps on. Uh, just last season, which is pretty interesting. I think Bateman would be a good fit there. Um, you do sort of have to wonder with the Sammy Watkins signing, uh, is receiver really that pressing of a need, right? Are they, you know, I don't think they're going to necessarily change the way they play offense, right? And are they going to just have all these three wide receiver sets and oh, let Lamar throw the ball 40 times a game? I still don't really think that's their style. What I did think was their style was having that sort of punishing defense and particularly front seven. And when you lost Yannick and Judon, uh, I think that a guy like Zavin, who to me would be a good 3-4 outside linebacker, I know, Mike, you sort of disagree and would put him in the middle more so, but that's just where I went, right? And then you went, uh, Mike, towards towards Jalen, right, who would be who would be more so the Yannick replacement. Talk about him real quick. Absolutely. And, uh, again, if you guys watched our prospect videos, I'm not a huge fan on him, but it seems like, uh, at least just looking at mock drafts and, and different analysts, I think they're a little bit higher on him than I am and probably closer to where Mike might be with, with Jalen Phillips. I think he's, you know, he does play smart. I think, you know, being able to play in that three, four, um, yeah, he can put his hand in the dirt, but he also can play pretty technically sound and, and maybe, you know, use him in a little bit more variety of a way. Um, is he a true pass rusher? Yes. But I think you could maybe add a little bit to um, his game where some of the other pass rushers available at this point, you know, being Rousseau, probably being the next one, maybe off the board. Um, potentially. Um, I, I just think Phillips fits, you know, kind of that 3-4 mold a little bit better and um, can be a plug-and-play or at least a rotational piece come day one for, for the Ravens. No, I definitely agree. I know I'll be interested personally to see just what happens with his concussion history, right? Obviously, we talked about that in his video, four of them uh, prior to UCLA making him retire before he ultimately, uh, you know, quit the sport, was out of it for a, a, a quite a few months. I want to say 18 goes down to... Uh, goes down to Miami and, and ultimately becomes a first-round pick there. So I'll be interested to see, you know, people have said, oh, he'll go as high as 11 to the Giants. I don't know if I necessarily see that being the case, but I do think here if the Ravens were to take a chance on him that, you know, you could sort of hide some of those flaws that, you know, Mike and I might have seen on film uh, with some of those other players around him, right? That defense is just special. Adding him would make it even better. Another team that was special last year in my eyes was the New Orleans Saints, right? A team that I said – uh, going into the year, I thought it was going to be a Super Bowl champion. Obviously, they fell a little bit a little bit short yet again, but I think we're in a different spot than where they were last year, right? You know, last year, Mike and I, we talked about them drafting Cesar Ruiz as sort of this luxury pick. Um, I don't think there's any luxury picks anymore. You talk about a team whose starting linebackers are Zach Bond, Demario Davis, and Andrew Dowell, right? I, I don't know. You know, they've had some cap casualties, to say the least. You're talking about wide receiving core of Michael Thomas, great, but otherwise, Traquan Smith, Marquez Callaway, and Deontay Harris. I think that uh, we all kind of, at least Mike and I, I'll say, we sort of filled those needs. Ben, you went a, a, a wild route, a radical route in my mind. You went Phillips. Uh, what's the sort of thought process there, despite having Cam Jordan and uh, Marcus Davenport? Yeah, so I, I thought he would be a great replacement for Trey Hendrickson. They played kind of similar role and uh, similar play style, but um, yeah. For sure. It, it, I, I do see it. I just think they have, you know, there's some positions that, you know, can be addressed maybe a little bit sooner. And I think, you know, better players available, at least on my big board, and that would be Jamin. I think, you know, as that third linebacker to come day one, if it plug in Jamin, uh, to play that will linebacker spot for that defense and then eventually maybe move him to, to middle when Demario Davis is, you know, um, he, he's getting up there in age and to be his eventual replacement. Um, I, I think Jamin makes a lot of sense for them. I think it, you could play day one as that will linebacker and then maybe, you know, 
um, either stick at that position or eventually move into that middle linebacker spot um, come, you know, Davis's eventual retirement. So, um, and he's probably my favorite player on the board at this point. So maybe it's a little bit biased on my part. Um, so, but I think it makes a lot of sense for the Saints here at this point. So, and I honestly see, you know, Mike, where you went with, with wide receiver being a, um, a really good pick for them. So maybe some of your thoughts on that. What's well, interesting because, you know, Elijah's a guy that I haven't really got into much yet, but, you know, just the way my boards fell, you know, you still have Rashad Bateman available, right? So I think that that's sort of a more interesting discussion. For me, at least by all accounts, everybody else seems to have Elijah Moore as sort of that next guy. Obviously, there's some debate him, Kadarius Tony, Rondell Moore. I think Elijah Moore would fit better as that number two, whereas those other guys might uh, be more, uh, more so that slot receiver role that I think they already have filled. But Either way, I think you have to either sure up that defense and try and compete off of that, or you have to help out Taysom Hill and or Jameis Winston uh, to the best of your ability. And I think that's sort of the route all of us went. Just pretty different ways that we got there, right? And, you know, speaking of another team that's gotten there in some unique ways, the Green Bay Packers, um, you know, coming off the back of last year's draft, I don't know what they're doing. Jordan Love, A.J. Dillon, Josiah DeGuara, pretty questionable, but I will say, uh, I think all of us, according to our picks, have some faith in them this year. These are all three interesting players. So, Mike, I'll pass it to you first. Rashad Bateman just talked about him a little bit for you, but um, a nice supplement to Devontae Adams now, huh? Yeah, it's crazy. Out of all our picks, this one, out of the you know some of the top five, um, this one might seem like the best fit. It makes so much sense for the team. Uh, but even if Bateman are the next wide receiver available, you know, it seems like the Green Bay Packers have been wanting a number two for quite a while now. And, um, you know, after last year, um, it's fingers crossed. So I think this team, maybe they, you know, listen to Aaron Rodgers a little bit. Uh, you know, they already drafted his replacement. This time, you might as well give him some weapons to work with. Um, I, I honestly see offensive linemen more. I just, on my big board, there really wasn't one that might have um, fit the pick or the mold for something they might be looking for. So um, Bateman was the pick here. Um, if he's still available, I think it's an absolute – you know, it'd be a disgrace if, if the Packers don't take a player like him um, with their pick. So, you know, kind of, you know, same spice, maybe a little bit different flavor. Uh, would be bad with another wide receiver. Maybe some of your thoughts. Yeah, so Rodgers has always enjoyed throwing to his uh, slot receivers. Um, but he really hasn't had that opportunity since uh, Randall Cobb was let go. I think Kadarius offers a very explosive option in that slot that can kind of let – Aaron Rodgers uses full arsenal. No, I definitely agree with that. I just think it might be a little bit high for Kadarius, man. Just in my opinion, right off of what I saw on film, uh, it's tough to draft a guy with his skill set so early. I think he's sort of that Curtis Samuel. And while I agree, he would really, you know, help about that offense. Uh, I, I think, I think it might be a little bit of a reach for that front office, but at this point, you know, any help would be appreciated from Rogers' behalf. I know with me, I went with what a lot of other people might consider a reach of my own, right? Uh, Jalen Mayfield, I think a guy out of Michigan who at right tackle this past season really impressed me uh, with just everything that he was doing, right? Whether it was as a tenacious run blocker, as a, you know, technically sound uh, guy in pass protection, I just felt like he was very solid all around. I know that offensive line maybe isn't as, uh, rock solid as it has been in years past. Obviously, you have Bakhtiari, albeit coming off an injury. Otherwise, though, you have you know John Runyon, Elton Jenkins, uh, Lucas Patrick, and Billy Turner, right? Which I don't think anybody's writing home about. And uh, I hope those guys aren't the downfall that end up writing the last chapter of Aaron Rodgers' career, right? Uh, knock on wood there in, in terms of any potential injuries. But I think guy like Jalen Mayfield could certainly uh, sort of end any of those concerns in terms of can play tackle, can kick him inside the guard, can kind of do it all. And at the end of the day, I do think we're all sort of on the same page. Just got to help out Aaron Rodgers in any way you can. Just so happens my board fell a little bit differently. Otherwise, in terms of the Buffalo Bills, you guys, again, were on this wide receiver thing. Of course, they, they lost John Brown. Cole Beasley is getting up there in age. Uh, ben, I'll pass it right to you. What's sort of the mindset there with Terrace Marshall Jr.? So it's a lot like how you had uh, Terrace Marshall to uh, the Browns. You have your slot receiver in Cole Beasley. You have your number one and Stefan Diggs, you kind of need that number two receiver, that red zone threat, and uh, this is just where Mar uh, Marshall fits. Mike, I think you kind of have the same idea as me with the Packers. Uh, do you want to expand on that a little bit? 
Yeah, for sure. I think it's a good team, good roster. I think they have some luxuries. Might not have a huge impact come day one, but um, I think it's a pick for the future. Um, obviously, you know, with the wide receiver, you're going to be rotating him in. He'll have production come day one, but once Cole Beasley really kind of, you know, he's getting up there in age, he's going to retire. Um, he's kind of, he's going to eventually fill that role. And I think that's great. You know, when you have teams that, you know, have good rosters, a lot of talent available, um, it gives you these luxuries that you could develop players behind, you know, some veterans that are already, you know, obviously Colt Beasley really lit it up at, with the Bills last year. And then you can also learn from Stefan Diggs. I just think it's a it's a really nice match here and makes maybe a little too much sense. Mike, I think your pick is interesting. Maybe a little bit of a stretch here, but... Well, receiver was interesting because, you know, none of you guys did mention, I don't believe, at least I didn't hear you bring up Emmanuel Sanders, right? And, you know, him... Diggs, Beasley, Gabe Davis as well. They're all under contract, not only this season, as well as next season, right, into 2022. So I think at that point, Josh Allen, his his weapons are kind of set in stone, at least from my perspective. Um, I'm just trying to uh, protect him, right, and, and make his job as easy as possible from there. I considered a running back, in all honesty, if it, were, if it weren't for them having taken uh, Singletary and Moss relatively early these past couple of years, I think this could be a, a pretty nice spot for Travis Etienne. I just decided to go with uh, Wyatt Davis here out of OSU, who, uh, you know, I think he could be an upgrade from John Feliciano day one. I think he could be an upgrade from Cody Ford day one. And I think that either way you slice it, he could make your uh, offense even more explosive than it was last year. Mike, I know we have talked quite a bit off camera about this running back position. What were your thoughts there on the whole ETN debate? Or do you think they could be in market for in the market for somebody later? Or are they not going to be in the market for anybody at all? They're just going to keep passing the ball 45 times a game. I don't know. I just don't think you put the the draft capital they have into that position and not plan to get something out of it. Obviously, my, if I was picking for, for my own personal thoughts off this roster, it'd be ETN. I think he's the pick here. I think it makes him or, or Javante Williams. Um, I think it's more of what they need. I think that could really – again, they, ha they already have a pretty solid offensive line. Um, I, I just think so, you know, when you're picking at, at, at you know, in the 30s, you have more luxury. Um, so – I think adding a player, an offensive weapon like ETN, um, you know, can catch on the backfield as well as basically just kind of do it all. Um, I think it makes too much sense. But, again, you don't just replace this much draft capital, especially saying it's pretty early on with, with Moss and Singletary. So I would, I would love to see it, but I can't imagine they're going to give up on all that this soon. But a team that you know, we've already seen, probably not giving up on too much, lost a couple of players, and back in the first round would be uh, Baltimore Ravens. So – um, Mike, I think your pick is interesting, and I can't disagree with it. He's just been off my board for quite a while now. So maybe some of your thoughts with disease going to the Ravens. I, I really like that pick. Well, for me, it's interesting because I'm doubling up, right? Obviously, I went Zayvon Collins to replace that Matt Judon role. Uh, now I'm going Aziz to replace Yannick, and I'm not sure if that'll be what they do in reality. But when you look at really the rest of the defense, examine some of the other holes. I mean, they're rumored to be bringing in Alejandro Villanueva to replace the hole left by uh, Orlando Brown. That's why, you know, as much as I like your guys' picks, I think that – uh, you know, we could see some sort of movement there in the next couple of days that sort of rules those guys out. Otherwise, in terms of receivers, I think it'd be a little bit of a stretch considering I'm already, what, six or seven deep on my board. But I think the disease, if he's available here, and I really think he might be available, right? Because, you know, not, a, not somebody who uh, his pro day numbers jump out of the gym, right? He's not some crazy athlete. He's more of a technically sound guy. And I feel like, you know, some people at this point have – have put Jason away ahead of Aziz Ojulari, right? So I wouldn't be necessarily shocked if Aziz drops quite a bit. Um, and if he does, kind of similarly to what we saw them do with Patrick Queen last year, where they stop that fall and and snag somebody that we, we all are pretty high on, I think that Aziz could be this year's version. Speaking of somebody that a lot of other people are quite high on, Ben, Tevin Jenkins. A lot of people love him. They love the tenacity. Um, on a run first team, you got to love that fit here in Baltimore, right? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I mean, we if you watch the film, you see a guy that really hates the defender when running the ball. Um, and this is a perfect fit. But, I mean, obviously Baltimore doesn't throw the ball that much. So he won't have to worry about having good form in the pass pro. So, um, yeah. 
No, I definitely agree. I know in my Tevin Jenkins video, I said, I think that unless he cleans up his technique, there's about three fits for him, right? I said it would be the Steelers because Big Ben isn't throwing the ball downfield anymore. I said it'd be the Buccaneers, even though they don't really need a tackle. And it'd be the Ravens, right? Because Omar is kind of in that same mold. Mike, you already had Tevin go though. So you kind of went with that next right tackle on the board, uh, Jalen Mayfield. What, what's sort of the thought process there? Uh, I think just to replace Orlando Brown and Philip Nueva isn't, you know, I it, when we put this together, I guess it was in conversation, but really wasn't in fruition, and I still don't think it is. But, oh, I think it makes a lot of sense. I think, you know, he's technically sound. He's already played right tackle. Kind of everything you said about um, with your pick of the Packers, I just, you know, think the Baltimore Ravens have that same exact need. So um, plug and play come day one, and I think it makes a lot of sense um, if they don't sign a player like Villanueva. And there also is that Harbaugh connection, right? You know, you talk about from the NFL side, right, you oftentimes want to – uh, try and do as much homework as you can in terms of, you know, interviewing that guy's college coaching staff, interviewing some of his teammates. Well, you know, John Harbaugh will have no easier time doing that uh, than he would with a guy like Jalen Mayfield, right? Because you just have to call up your brother who might be coming over for dinner later that night, right? I think that in that regard, uh, Mayfield could most certainly be the pick here. And even though he might be going a little bit on both of our boards, a little bit higher than other people have him, I do think that he makes a lot of uh, sense for either the Packers, as I had him, or here uh, with the Ravens, as you said, barring a Villanueva signing. And with that being said, the final, the very final uh, spot here in this mock draft, the Buccaneers. And I didn't really know where to go with the Bucks. right? On my notes here, I just wrote tough in all caps because the team that I think we saw in the Super Bowl – um, was pretty all-around solid and doesn't have very many holes. I happen to go uh, Dylan Raddins, the the sort of guard slash tackle out of North Dakota State. I know for me, I don't think that Alex Kappa is necessarily the best guy at guard. I think we're still trying to uh, extend Brady's life uh, and life expectancy in the league the, as far as you can, right? And I think a guy like Raddins, a small school guy, they've shown that willingness to go out and get an alley market before uh, Alex Kappa, as I said. I think this is a team who'd maybe be willing to take a chance on a guy like Raddins and could be an interesting player there. I know in terms of also taking a chance, a lot of people aren't high on Russo, Mike. Uh, you were a little bit higher on him than most. So we're talking about him and uh, the fit that you'd see for him here with the Buccaneers. Yeah, tons of potential there. And I think being able to learn behind JPP, who's getting up there in age 32, being able to, you know, come in on passing downs, maybe even as like a three tech um, come day one, I think that could be huge. Um, I, I think it's a developmental piece, but like if it hits, it will really hit because he has all the intangibles. And I don't think anyone can disagree there. And he showed potential. He showed some flashes. It just, you know, technique wasn't there. And um, if there's any place for him to learn about that technique, I think the box would be a perfect place for it. So um, kind of, you know, maybe not having all those intangibles, but uh, maybe having the athleticism there uh, would be, you know, Rondell Moore. I think that's an interesting pick for them. Maybe some of your thoughts um, why you went there, Ben. Yeah, the other depth chart, obviously the Bucks brought back, a, like, basically everyone from last year, except for Antonio Brown. Um, so I think you got to kind of plug in a receiver, um, even if Chris Godwin ends up playing outside, he's still an upgrade over Scotty Miller. I do like the DN pick from you, Mike. Uh, Rousseau, as a developmental piece, I was debating that here, but uh, ultimately just decided to go wide receiver. I think they're both really interesting. I think, you know, Rousseau could be a guy who put him behind in Dominic and Sue. And, uh, you know, as that at that sort of four tech spot where, you know, Sue in his age is playing less and less reps, uh, put a guy like Rousseau in there, maybe in a more limited capacity where, you know, over the next year, potentially two, uh, he continues to refine more and more. And I think that he could most certainly thrive. I know more is an interesting guy because, you know, there's a lot of questions with him, right? And questions that I personally don't have the answer to in terms of his injury history, only having played seven games over these past two years in college football, that's definitely a concern. But if there's a team that can afford to take a risk, it would most certainly be this Buccaneers roster. And then for a conclusion, just real quick here, obviously, uh, I wanted to quickly talk about some of the guys that we left off our board. I know I have Jamin Davis available, who, uh, as well as like a Davion Nixon, guys like that, uh, Travis Etienne, who I was pretty high on, but just didn't make it out of my mock. I think that, you know, if that's the talent we're talking about going into day two, we could most certainly be looking at a really fun uh, sort of Friday night there, uh, as I feel like there'd be a lot of action to get their hands on some good players. I know Ben... Zayvon Collins was an interesting one to me. I know you said you didn't know a ton about him, but a guy who a lot of people think could go, you know, in that sort of 15 to 20 range. Uh, you didn't have him on there. Any particular reason why, or was that just you couldn't really find a fit for him? 
Yes. So it was mostly the unfamiliarity with him, but um, got kind of wide receiver crazy towards the end there. Maybe for better or worse, he could have fit it with some of those teams, but it's a passing league, and I thought those questions needed to be answered more. And kind of off that, right, passing league, Mike, Travis Etienne, obviously having him fall into round two, you know, go, turn back time and tell somebody that a year ago you would have been shocked after that junior season he put up there. What's the what's the kind of thought for him heading into round two? I know you didn't have a ton of, of the top guys left available. Uh, any real notable guys other than Etienne, or was that about it? Yeah, I think actually both of them, would, like the two notable ones would be Etienne and Williams, Javante Williams, I think are both, you know, running backs that have – first round type talent or especially late in the first round I I just think it's a you know not a position that's highly valued in the NFL and I think a lot of those teams in the back end of the first round had some more dire needs and maybe had that position already kind of filled filled out pretty well so um, just kind of some of my thoughts there I think they're both players that'll probably be picked him and Javante Williams will probably be picked pretty early in that second round I think a lot a lot of those teams picking early in the first um Really needed a running back, just obviously there was no player that really fit that, you know, best player available at that position. No, Mike, I think I definitely agree with you there. And uh, for anybody who might have made it this far, if you agree with one of us, make sure you drop our names down below in the comment section and tell us who you thought uh, is going to have the more accurate mock, right? Of course, come Thursday night, uh, you never know what's going to happen, right? One of the most unpredictable days and really weekends in all of sports on an annual basis. So we'll certainly be a fun one. I know I thought it was a lot of fun to get Ben in here, a little bit of a different perspective than what you guys might normally hear from Mike and I. Uh, might have been a little bit nervous, right? But, hey, go back uh, a year from now and and tell tell Mike and I how we sounded in our first, first couple videos. So I appreciate Ben for coming. Uh, I appreciate you guys for hanging around and listening. But with that being said, that's all we really have for you guys today. I think I think we're mic'd up. And now we're miking out. Peace, guys.